Ladies and gentlemen, announcing the arrival of His Royal Highness Sultan Aslan Shah, the Sultan of Para, His Royal Highness Raja Dr. Nazrin Shah, the Raja Mudo of Para, Her Royal Highness Twanku Zara Salim Raja, Puan Basa of Para, accompanied by the Right Honorable Lord Walker and Lady Walker, and the Vice Chancellor of the University of Malaya. Ampun tuanku, Patik mohon perkenan duli-duli tuanku untuk Patik meneruskan acara majlis ini dalam bahasa Inggeris. Your Royal Highness, Sultan Aslan Shah, the Sultan of Pera. Your Royal Highness, Raja Dr. Nazrin Shah, Raja Muda of Pera. Your Royal Highness, Tuanku Zara Salim Raja Puan Besar of Pera. Your Highnesses, the Right Honourable Lord Walker and Lady Walker, the Honourable Menteri Besar Pera, the Right Honourable Chief Justice of Malaysia, Your Excellencies, my Lords, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben Ibrahim and I will be your MC for this afternoon. On behalf of the Trustees of the Sultan Aslan Shah Foundation, and the University of Malaya. I have been given both the privilege and the honor to welcome each and every one of you to the 25th Sultan Aslan Shah Law Lecture this evening. Without much ado, I now have the pleasure to invite the Vice Chancellor of the University of Malaya to introduce the speaker for this evening's lecture. Vice Chancellor. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh dan salam sejahtera. Menghadap duli yang maha mulia Paduka Sri Sultan Perak Darul Ridwan, Sultan Azlan Shah, Tuanku Chancellor Universiti Malaya. Duli yang teramat mulia Raja Muda Perak Darul Ridwan, Raja Dr Nazrin Shah, Tuanku Pro Chancellor Universiti Malaya. Duli yang teramat mulia Raja Puan Besar Perak Darul Ridwan. Tuanku Zahra Salim Ampun Tuanku Patik sekalian memanjat setinggi-tinggi kesyukuran Kehadrat ilahi kerana dengan lempah izinnya Tuanku sehat walafiat dan dapat berangkat untuk bersama-sama Patik Dalam majlis pada petang ini Patik menjunjung setinggi-tinggi kasih di atas perkenan Duli-duli Tuanku mencemal duli bagi menjayakan majlis ini Sesungguhnya dengan keberangkatan duli-duli tuanku, ia memberi erti yang besar kepada majlis yang ternama ini iaitu The Sultan Azlan Shah Law Lecture Series. Siri kuliah undang-undang Sultan Azlan Shah ini sememangnya telah memberi impak dalam pembentukan dan perkembangan undang-undang di tanah air dan menjadi satu-satunya acara terulung yang ditunggu-tunggu oleh semua yang terlibat dalam profesion undang-undang. Alhamdulillah, cetusan idea siri kuliah ini adalah satu-satunya inisiatif besar di bawah naungan ke bawah duli tuanku. Seterusnya, patik pohon perkenan tuanku untuk menyampaikan sepatah dua kata kepada para hadirin sekalian dalam bahasa Inggeris. Ampun tuanku. Yang amat berhormat Menteri Besar Perak, The Right Honourable Lord Walker of Guesting Top, Justice of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. Yang bahagia, Tuh Puan Dr. Aisyah Ong, Pro Chancellor University of Malaya. Yang bahagia, Tan Sri Siti Norma Yaakob, Pro Chancellor University of Malaya. Yang bahagia, Tan Sri Arshad Ayub, Chairman of the University of Malaya Board. Members of the University Board and Management. Your Excellencies, Judges and Lawyers, 
distinguished professors and academics, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Most of you present here today are aware that this series of lectures, the Sultan Azlan Shah Law Lecture, is held annually in recognition of His Royal Highness Sultan Azlan Shah's contribution to the development of Malaysian law and for His Royal Highness' unstinting commitment in upholding the rule of law and the independence of the ju judiciary in the country. His Royal Highness' exemplary contributions have long been recognized both locally and internationally. In recognition of this and in honor of His Royal Highness, over the past 25 years, distinguished speakers from the Commonwealth and the United States have come, especially to our shores, to deliver these lectures. His Royal Highness was a senior judge in the country for several years. Having been the Chief Justice of Malaya for many years, His Royal Highness occupied the highest position in the Malaysian judiciary as the Lord President of the Federal Court of Malaysia, now renamed as the Chief Justice of Malaysia, before His Royal Highness relinquished the post to become the Sultan of Perak in 1984. On this 25th Sultan Azlan Shah Law Lecture, we have a most eminent speaker, the Right Honourable Lord Walker of Guesting Top, in person to deliver the timely topic, Would it have made any difference, cause and effect in commercial law? On this note, it gives me great pleasure to invite the Right Honourable Lord Walker of Guesting Top to deliver the 25th Sultan Azlan Shah Law Lecture entitled Would it have made any difference, cause and effect in commercial law? Your Royal Highnesses, Your Excellencies, Vice-Chancellor, Chief Justices of Malaysia and Singapore, distinguished guests. It is a great honor for me to be invited to give this lecture. I am deeply conscious that I am following in the footsteps of some very distinguished judges and jurists who have given the Sultan Aslan Shah Law Lecture in previous years, especially as I have the honor of delivering this 25th lecture. May I also express my sincere gratitude at having the opportunity with my wife, Suzanne, of enjoying the extraordinary beauty of your country and the warmth and kindness of your welcome. At the same time, I cannot forbear to mention my sadness, shared, I am sure, by all who knew him, that last year's lecturer, my friend and colleague Alan Roger, Lord Roger of Earls Ferry, died a few months ago. He was most unexpectedly struck down by a fatal illness while he was still in his intellectual prime. His death is a great loss to the British judiciary and public and a grievous personal loss to all of us who knew him. I'm going to speak this evening about cause and effect in commercial law with a quick look at pu public law as well. Questions of causation are among the most interesting and difficult topics that have to be addressed by legal scholars, lawyers, and judges. They are by no means limited to the tort of negligence, but that is probably the field in which they most often occur. In the area of clinical negligence, for instance, there is a recurring problem of late diagnosis. If a doctor, through his own fault, fails to send his patient for an X-ray or an MRI scan or a biopsy, and as a result there is a delay, whether measured in days or weeks or months, in the correct diagnosis of some serious condition, how much difference does that make to the patient's prospects of a full recovery? And how much difference does it make to the patient's legal rights? If expert evidence indicates on the balance of probabilities 
that prompt diagnosis would have made no difference to the pa patient's chances, then the law's hard answer is that the patient has no cause of action in tort, though there may be a claim for nominal damages for breach of contract. That is because the tort of negligence requires not only a duty of care and a breach of that duty, but also loss occasioned, that is caused by the breach. In the leading English case of Greg and Scott, there was, through a doctor's negligence, a delay of nine months in, in the diagnosis of a particularly serious form of cancer. In the leading Australian case of Tabit and Ged, a six-year-old child was admitted to hospital with headaches and nausea, and there was a de delay of only 24 hours, but potentially a critical 24 hours, in her being examined by CT scan and EEG. In each case, the conclusion on the expert evidence was that there was less than an even chance that early diagnosis would have made a significant difference to the prognosis. The House of Lords in the former case and the High Court of Australia in the latter case declined to develop the law so as to extend the notion of loss of a chance to the field of personal injury caused by medical negligence. That is a very interesting area, but it's not what I'm going to speak about this evening. I've mentioned it to point a contrast. Where difficult problems of causation arise in clinical negligence, it is usually because medical science cannot give a definite answer to a scientific question. Expert witnesses differ in their opinions. The origin or future course of some trauma or infection or carcinoma may be a matter on which medical science cannot yet give a precise etiology or make a confident prognosis. In another type of negligence, establishing causation and thus liability depends not on medical science, but on how one or more human beings would have acted but for the negligence complained of. Some of these are loss of a chance cases in the full sense. A chance of future benefit is what the plaintiff has lost. All of them involve a lost chance in the wider sense that the court has lost the chance of ever knowing for certain what would have happened if there had been no breach of duty on the part of the defendant. Instead, the court has to construct a hypothetical parallel universe in which there was no fall from grace and decide what difference, if any, it would have made to the plaintiff if things had gone as they should have gone. The earliest well-known case on loss of a chance is Chaplin and Hicks, which is celebrating its anniversary, if that's the right way of putting it, this year. It's a case that is still, I know, mentioned in the courts in Malaya, in Malaysia, but I hope I may be pardoned for uh, referring to it in some detail again. It's sometimes referred to as the beauty contest case, but that is a misdescription which does not do duty to the does not do justice to the talented Miss Chaplin. It was a competition for aspiring actresses organized by a popular newspaper, no doubt in order to boost its circulation. The original plan was for the four photographs of 24 f young women finalists to be published in the newspaper and for 12 winners to be selected by readers' votes, which might have made it little more than a beauty contest. But in the event, over 6,000 young ladies entered the competition and the rules were changed to deal with the unexpectedly large number of entries. Fifty finalists were chosen by readers on a regional basis, and they were, no doubt, chosen for their looks. But the winners were to be chosen by Mr. Seymour Hicks, later Sir Seymour Hicks, a well-known actor-manager, by auditions, or at least interviews, at the Aldwych Theatre in London. Mr. Hicks could be expected to choose the winners on the basis of acting ability 
and the ability to learn their lines as well as on looks. We know from the law report that Miss Chaplin was the top finalist of the London region. We also know from the law report that she was already an actress because she was at the time appearing at a theatre in Dundee in Scotland. That was where a redirected letter reached her on the morning of the 6th of January 1909 telling her to be at the Aldwych Theatre for her interview at 4 p.m. that day. That was impossible for her, and that was how she lost her chance. The jury awarded her £100, which was a lot of money in those days. We shall never know what was in the jury's collective mind, but in principle they had two tasks. The first was to, to decide whether there had been a breach of contract, and they decided that there had been a breach since Miss Chaplin had not been given a reasonable chance of presenting herself for selection. The second task was to assess the value of what she had lost. This depended on whether Mr. Hicks, a very experienced judge of acting talent, would have chosen her for a prize. The jury's award showed that they thought she had a very good chance of getting a prize. In Chaplin and Hicks, the issue was what difference it would have made if Mr. Hicks, as judge of a talent contest, had seen Miss Chaplin. A much more common version of that situation is when the court has to decide what conclusion a real judge would have reached on a plaintiff's claim, which has never had its day in court and never will have its day in court. That is what happens whenever a claim becomes statute barred or is struck out for want of prosecution as a result of a lawyer's breach of professional care. And the client seeks a remedy against the lawyer instead. A well-known example in England is the case of Mrs. Kitchen, whose husband was unfortunately electrocuted in an accident said to have been caused by the negligence of the electricity board. In the Court of Appeal, Lord Evershed, Master of the Rolls, said that the solicitor was liable if Mrs. Kitchen had lost a shows in action of re reality and substance. And if so, though its valuation might be difficult, it is the duty of the court to determine that value as best it can. Mrs. Kitchen had been a truthful and candid witness, and she was awarded 2,000 pounds about two-thirds of the full amount of her claim against the electricity board. This all happened over 50 years ago when the real value of money was very different from what it is today. Note that it would be very rare for a plaintiff in that situation to recover the full 100% of, uh, of his or her claim, however strong it appeared, if the result of the claim would have turned on the outcome of contested litigation. Many of you will be familiar with some very well-known observations of Mr. Justice McGarry, but they bear repetition. Mr. Justice McGarry said, as everybody who has had anything to do with the law well knows, the path of the law is strewn with examples of open and shut cases which somehow were not, of unanswerable charges which in the event were completely answered, of inexplicable conduct which was fully explained, of fixed and unalterable determinations that, by discussion, suffered a change. Even more difficult questions can arise in claims for professional negligence in lawyers' advisory work. A striking example is the New Zealand case of Mr. Benton's claim against his solicitors. In order to understand the case, you need to know that New Zealand family law provides for a matrimonial home to belong to the married couple in equal shares, unless there is a written agreement based on independent advice to both sides for some other form of ownership. When Mr. Benton married in 1976, he owned a house in Auckland and his wife owned a, build, a building plot in another town. At first they lived in his house, but they decided to build a house on her plot. He paid for most of the building cost, 
and his wife transferred to him a 21% interest in the new house in recognition of the money that he'd spent. In 1983, he retired, and they decided to see whether they liked living in the new house. The next year, he sold his house and used the, a large part of the proceeds to purchase his wife's 79% interest in the new house. It was at this stage that his lawyer failed to advise him about the Matrimonial Property Act 1976 of New Zealand. Later, he spent more money in extending the house. In 1995, the couple separated, and in 1996, Mr. Benton was advised by other lawyers that he must pay 90,000 New Zealand dollars to settle his separated wife's unanswerable claim to half the value of the house. Even though he had brought, bought out the whole of her interest at market value and disposed of his own house in the process of doing so. I've gone into the facts in some detail to bring out the complexities of the causation problem as it was seen by the Court of Appeal. If in 1984 the solicitor had advised Mr. Benton about the Matrimonial Property Act, he might have said that he completely trusted his wife and he didn't want to opt out of the Act. And if he had wanted to opt out of the Act, would she have agreed? And if she had not agreed, would he have gone ahead anyway? At first instance, the divisional court dismissed Mr. Benton's claim on the basis that he had suffered no loss. On a first appeal to the High Court, he succeeded, but was awarded only about 40% of what he claimed. On the second appeal, the Court of Appeal of New Zealand awarded him $90,000, including an element for deferment. Even the Court of Appeal was split in its reasoning. Justice Hammond thought it better to concentrate on what actually did happen. He said, it is correct that a great many solicitors' negligence cases as to damages turn on what-if questions. That is one reason why they're so contentious and so frequently go to appeal. However, I take the view, and this is my point of departure from the judgment of my colleagues, that it is more in accord with fundamental principle and with the facts of this instance to say simply that there was a direct form of loss which flowed from the failure of the solicitor to give the relevant, relevant advice, the measure of damages is simply what it cost to remove the blot from the clean title which Mr. Benton thought he was getting. I see a lot of force in that. The $90,000 which Mr. Benton, Benton had to pay was a fact which made what if questions irrelevant unless indeed Mr. Benton's loss was really his own choice. That brings me to a point on the majority judgment in Benton which is worth emphasizing. The loss of a chance approach is appropriate only for quantifying damages once some loss has been established. If the plaintiff would have taken just the same course whether or not he got careful advice, he has lost nothing caused by negligent advice. And the fact of loss, as opposed to quantification of damage, is an all or nothing question to be decided on the balance of probabilities. This is established by numerous authorities, one of the clearest uh, explanations being by Sir John Donaldson, Master of the Rolls. He said in a case called Hodson, take the case of a solicitor who fails to advise his client that the property which he is about to purchase is subject to a right of way. If the client had been told, he would or would not have gone ahead with the transaction. That would have been his choice, not the choice of fate. The damages recoverable by the solicitor's client would therefore be all or nothing, depending on whether he would have, uh, depending on whether he could prove on the balance of probabilities that he would have abandoned the transaction. Similarly, if Mr. Benton had agreed in cross-examination that he did trust his wife and would not have tried to opt out of the Matrimonial Property Act, or if other evidence had led the judge to that conclusion, that would have been the end of Mr. Benton's claim against his solicitor. His loss would have been the result of his own choice. The distinction is reasonably clear in principle, but in practice it may become elusive. 
as it was put in allied maples, it's sometimes difficult to tell where causation leading to liability ends and quantification of the amount of the loss begins. Allied Maples was another solicitor's negligence claim, raising quite complex questions of the what-if variety in the context of a substantial commercial transaction. Allied Maples was a subsidiary within the ASDA supermarket group. It was negotiating to buy a portfolio of 48 leasehold retail outlets for £26 million. In the course of the negotiations, the seller, a company in another group, proposed that four of them should be acquired indirectly by the purchase of all the shares in one of its subsidiaries after other leasehold properties had been hived off to another group company. The purchaser's solicitors failed to spot a defect in this change of plan. The purchaser might find that its newly acquired subsidiary incurred losses because it was still liable on the tenant's covenants in respect of properties which it no longer owned because they'd been hived off. The deal was completed on this defective basis and the unforeseen liability did arise. The company sued its solicitors and a split trial was ordered first on liability and then if necessary on quantum. The Court of Appeal criticized this decision for a reason that I've already mentioned in a situation like this, it's hard to know where causation ends and quantification begins. A lot turned on the hypothetical question, if the solicitors had drawn attention to the problem before exchange of contracts, what would have happened? At one extreme, the purchaser might have pulled out of the whole deal. The judge thought this very unlikely. At the other extreme, it might have decided to run the risk this seems to have been regarded as even less likely. In between, the parties might have continued to negotiate and agreed a reduced price, again unlikely because of the difficulty of putting a figure on the risk. Alternatively, the purchaser might have succeeded in negotiating a limited tailor-made covenant for indemnity. The judge thought this the most likely outcome, but did not quantify the chance. The Court of Appeal directed that the issue of quantum of damages, depending on evaluation of the chance of successful renegotiation, should go to trial. I would not want you to think that it's only lawyers who sometimes make expensive mistakes. So do auditors, valuers, and even just occasionally actuaries. In relation to auditors, I should reiterate a very basic point. Before a plaintiff gets to quantifying his loss, he must establish that the loss has been caused by breach of the defendant's duty to him. And but before he gets to that, he must establish that the defendant did indeed owe him a duty of care. Under English law, and I believe the law of Malaysia as well, the basic duty owed by a company's auditors is to the company as a corporation not to individual shareholders or creditors or prospective lenders or equity investors. That was finally established as part of the law of England by Caparo in 1990, a decision which is recognized as an important landmark in the general development of the tort of negligence. It's only in special circumstances that auditors are, will be held on an objective test to have assumed responsibility towards a wider class. That may occur, for instance, if the auditor's firm has a, ha a hands-on involvement in arranging finance so as to assume responsibility towards prospective lenders, or in preparing a valuation of shares which were to be compulsorily acquired from minority shareholders so as to assume responsibility to the individual minority shareholders affected. If both a duty and a breach are established, issues of causation often arise. For some time, the decision of the English Court of Appeal in Gulu was much cited as an authority. Auditors who had failed to spot overstatements of stock and profits in three consecutive years account, accounts of a trading company were held not liable for its eventual decline into insolvency. Upholding a strikeout, the court stated, 
the breach of duty gave the opportunity to Galu and its holding company to incur and to continue to incur trading losses. It did not cause those trading losses in the sense in which the word cause is used in law. But later cases have shown that Galu does not establish any general rule. This is an area in which the court must pay, pay close attention to the particular facts as pleaded and proved. There's a valuable discussion in the judgments of the New Zealand Court of Appeal in Siu Hoi, where Justice Thomas saw Galu as, and I quote, a timely reminder that the answer to this question will not be resolved by the application of a formula, but by the application of a judge's common sense. The judge needs to stand back from the case, examine the facts closely, and then decide whether there is a causal link between the failure and the loss in issue which can be identified and supported by reasoned argument. Siu Hoi and, some, uh, and numerous other cases show that where damages are claimed for breach of some professional duty, questions of causation cannot be considered apart from the scope of the duty owed. In Caparo, Lord Oliver said, it has to be borne in mind that the duty of care is inseparable from the damage which the plaintiff claims to have suffered from its breach. It's not a duty to take care in the abstract, but a duty to avoid causing to the particular plaintiff damage of the particular kind which he has in fact sustained. This brings me to the large and controversial topic of SAMCO, which is an abbreviation for South Australia Asset Management Corporation. Uh, that decision of the House of Lords raises the almost insoluble problem of damages for a negligent valuation made in a falling property market, a phenomenon that Britain has seen three times during my professional career. I approached this topic with some trepidation as I could easily devote an entire lecture or even a series of lectures to, to this single case. But don't let me fill you with trepidation. I'm not going to spend long on it. The decision has been followed in New Zealand, but not in Australia. It has been criticized by Professor Jane Stapleton, one of the world's leading scholars on legal causation, in a case, as a case in which Lord Hoffman, who gave the leading speech, aimed, aimed at avoiding a false paradox, and in doing so, in Professor Stapleton's opinion, created a real and disturbing one. Let me try and explain the problem in SAMCO and then make just two brief comments on it. Suppose that at a time when the property market is booming and valuers are inclined to be bullish, a professional valuer values an office block at 10 million pounds. Suppose that this valuation is excessive, indeed so excessive as to be negligent. A proper valuation would have been 8 million pounds. A bank relying on the valuation advances £6 million secured by a mortgage. The mortgage or defaults at a time when the property market has fallen by 40% and on a forced sale the, le the, lender, the bank lender realizes only £3 million. What is the proper measure of damages? The bank's total loss is £3 million disregarding interest and costs. But arguably this was the result of two causes the valuer's negligence, which was his fault, and a general fall in the market, which was not his fault. One approach would be to say that 40% of the loss was caused by the falling market and 60% by the valuer's negligence, resulting in damages of £1.8 million. In Samco, Lord Hoffman reached a similar, not, but not precisely the same, conclusion by treating the fall in the market as having the effect of capping damages at the amount of the initial disparity between the valuer's figure and the correct figure, in my example, two million pounds. That would produce damages of two million pounds. On this example, the difference between 1.8 million and two million pounds is not enormous, but different figures can produce a bigger gap, and the gap can go either way. My first comment is that there is an important distinction, which Lord Hoffman discussed at some length, between providing information and providing advice. 
Normally, a valuer does no more, uh, normally a valuer provides no more than information, his expert opinion, right or wrong, as to the current value. If he goes further and makes a recommendation, for instance, to make a mortgage advance of 65% of his valuation, he is in danger of being held responsible for more remote consequences, including a fall in the market, because he may be supposed to be providing for that risk. The fact that the valuation in the Australian case of Kenny and Good recommended a 65% advance is one of the reasons, although not the only reason, for the High Court of Australia at differing in that case from the House of Lords in Samco. My second comment is that whether the scope of the duty of care is seen as a special aspect of causation or as a separate element of liability for civil wrongs is a question that legal scholars will continue to debate for a long time. Decisions of the highest courts will probably move at a slower pace in the wake of the academic debate. The clearest statement of where English law has got to at present is probably in the speech of Lord Hobhouse in the, platform's loan, the Platform Loans case in 2000, in which he said of the Samco principle, the principle is not derived from any application of mathematics. The loss suffered by the lender in the event of a market fall may not be directly proportionate or equivalent to the original overvaluation. The principle is essentially a legal rule which is applied in a robust way without the need for fine tuning or a, de or a detailed investigation of causation. So far I've been looking at cases where the cause of action is the tort of negligence, sometimes with a concurrent liability in contract. I want to mention three other commercial cases involving different causes of action. The first is Smith New Court in 1997. It was a case of deceit, that is deliberate deception inducing a plaintiff to act as his detriment. Citibank held 29 million shares in Ferranti, a quoted British electronics manufacturer. Citibank sold them to Smith New Newcourt, a market maker, telling them falsely that there were two other purchasers actively competing for the shares. As a result, Smith Newcourt bought at 82 pence a share, paying the full market price, whereas a substantial discount might have been expected for a placing of such a very large line of shares. What neither Smith Newcourt nor Citibank knew was that Ferranti had just been the victim of a huge fraud, which was disclosed about six weeks after the deal. Ferranti lost almost half of its net assets and its profits dropped by 60%. Smith Newcourt managed to dispose of its holding in relatively small parcels at a total loss of over 11 million pounds. The House of Lords held that Citibank was liable for the whole loss. The stock market valuation was not a true indication of the value of the shares that were purchased because there was a false market. Citibank was liable for the whole loss caused directly by its own employees' deceit, even though it had nothing to do with the fraud that caused the loss. It's a striking illustration of a stricter principle of causation being applied in the case of a tort that involves deliberate wrongdoing. The next case is about the charter of a ship. The vessel's name was the Golden Victory, decided by the House of Lords four years ago. It was a sort of mirror image of a loss of a chance case, in that it was a case in which the court did know how events had turned out, but the parties didn't, at the time of the breach of contract, know how events would turn out. In 1998, Golden Strait, the owners of the Golden Victory, chartered it for seven years to nip on Usen. Either party had the right to cancel the charter in the event of war or hostilities between, so far as relevant, the United States, the United Kingdom, and Iraq. In December 2001, the charterers repudiated the, con the charter when it still had four years to run. In March 2003, hostilities, sometimes called the Second Gulf War, broke out between the United States, the United Kingdom, and Iraq. Various issues of law arose, 
the most interesting of which was whether the outbreak of hostilities put a cap on the charterer's liability to pay damages for their repudiation of the contract. The arbitrator, looking at the factual situation as of December 2001, held that a reasonably well-informed person would have considered hostilities between the United States or the United Kingdom and Iraq as, quote, not inevitable or even probable, but merely a possibility. But there were various delays in the arbitration process. Hostilities did occur in March 2003, and the arbitrator, feeling himself bound by authority, reluctantly decided in favor of the charterers that there should be a cap on the damages. He was reluctant because, as he put it, it does not seem to me that it can be right that the value of that which the owners have lost and which is calculable on the date of breach in the then prevailing circumstances should thereafter vary according to when a determination is made in proceedings to enforce their rights and in perhaps quite different circumstances. The arbitrator's decision was upheld by the English Commercial Court and by a unanimous Court of Appeal. But the House of Lords was decided 3-2 in dismissing the further appeal. The majority thought it right in order to avoid overcompensating the owners to depart from the normal rule that damages should be ascertained at the date of breach. They relied on an old House of Lords case about statutory compensation for mining operations in which the Earl of uh, Halsbury, Lord Chancellor, with characteristic outspokenness, rejected the notion that you should shut your eyes to the true sum now you know it because you could not have guessed it then. For the minority, Lord Bingham stressed the importance of certainty in commercial cases. In rejecting the argument about overcompensation, he observed, there are, in my opinion, several answers to this. The first is that contracts are made to be performed, not broken. It may prove disadvantageous to break a contract instead of performing it. The second is that if, on their repudiation being accepted, the charterers had promptly honored their secondary obligation to pay damages, the transaction would have been settled well before the second Gulf War beca became a reality. The third is that the owners were, as the arbitrator held, entitled to, to be compensated for the value of what they had lost on the date it was lost, and it could not be doubted that what the, uh, what the owners lost that date was a charter party with slightly less than four years to run. He distinguished the mining case as concerned with the statutory rights to full compensation, not a common law claim for damages. The third commercial case I want to mention brings us back to solicitors. It was treated primarily as a contract case because there was an argument about an implied term. It could have been pleaded as a breach of fiduciary duty. I sat on the case in the House of Lords, and though I had been then in the law for nearly 50 years, I found the facts fairly shocking. Mr. Hilton was an honest, hard-working builder seeking to set up in a modest way as a property developer. He acquired a building plot, got a bank loan, and built a small block of flats. In the course of this activity, he met Mr. Bromwich, who expressed interest in buying the flats, and introduced, to Mr. And, and introduced Mr. Hilton to Barker's, Mr. Bromwich's solicitors. What Barker's knew, but Mr. Hilton did not know, was that Mr. Bromwich had just come out of prison for numerous bankruptcy offenses. Barker's knew because they had arranged his defense on the criminal charges. They did not disclose any of this to Mr. Hilton, nor did they disclose that they lent money to Mr. Bromwich, who had no significant assets of any sort, to enable him to pay the deposit when he contracted with Mr. Hilton to buy the flats. Barker's were acting for both parties. Mr. Bromwich then refused to complete the purchase, but also refused to remove his caution from the register. Mr. Hilton could not sell the flats to anyone. He got into more and more serious financial difficulties and was made bankrupt. When he sued Barker's, the solicitors, he lost both at first instance and in the Court of Appeal. Their reasoning was in part that if the solicitors had told Mr. Hilton that they could not act for him, 
he would have gone elsewhere to other solicitors, still ignorant that Mr. Bromwich was a rogue, a rogue and the same sorry story would have, been, uh, would have unfolded. So no loss was caused, it was said, by that breach of duty. I did not agree with that, and I'm glad to say that my colleagues agreed with me. Uh, I said the notion that one breach of duty by the solicitors, failure to tell Mr. Hilton that they could not act for him and that he should seek independent advice, should exonerate the solicitors in respect of a second and more serious breach of duty, failure to disclose to Mr. Hilton facts which would have saved him from ruin, seems contrary to common sense and justice. With increasing statutory regulation, commercial law often gets entangled with public law. It's therefore too uh, appropriate to add a short postscript about causation in public law. Judicial review is not in general concerned with the award of damages. But in England, private law claims for damages can arise as a so-called follow-on claim under public law regulation of competition. And when they do, difficult questions of causation often arise. A large company may have abused its market dominance, but it may be difficult for a smaller company to establish that, that a loss which it has suffered. For instance, failure to win a lucrative contract is attributable to that cause. The Takaro Properties case was something of a co-celeb in New Zealand 25 years ago, though the claim came to nothing in, an end, in the end. Some investors developed a high-grade holiday resort in the New Zealand uplands aimed at the top of the tourist market. It failed to attract enough wealthy customers and it had to close. Other foreign investors showed an interest in trying to turn it round but their investment needed government approval, which the minister, Mr. Rowling, repeatedly declined to give. He gave weight, as Takaro argued, much too much weight, to his wish to restrict foreign investment in New Zealand real estate. The company sued him in private law, in a private law action for damages. At first instance, it failed completely, the judge finding that even if approval had been given, the enterprise was facing, as the judge put it, nothing but disaster. The Court of Appeal took a different view, holding that the minister had failed to exercise due care in his decision and awarding 300,000 New Zealand dollars for the loss of a chance of turning round the enterprise. In the the uh, Court of Appeal uh, reached the same figure but by a different route. Finally, the Privy Council held that there was no breach of any duty and probably no public law duty at all. The last point I want to make about causation in public law is the most important. In judicial review of, a, of official decision making, the official decision maker may have failed to follow the proper procedure. He may have failed to carry out proper consultations or to give a proper period for lodging objections. In such a case, the riposte, it would not have made any difference anyway, carries very little weight. Occasionally, because judicial review is a discretionary remedy, it may be enough to cover a relatively small defect. But in a democratic society, the public are entitled to have their say and to deny that right is a serious failing, regardless of the likely outcome. It was very well put by Lord Hoffman in the Barclay case, in which one gallant lady protester upset plans for the redevelopment of the Fulham football stadium in West London. The European Directive on Environmental Impact Assessment required, Lord Hoffman said, the inclusive and democratic procedure prescribed by that directive in which the public, however misguided or wrong-headed its views may be, is given an opportunity to express its opinion on the environmental issues. There are many similar statements of principle about the importance of proper procedures in official decision-making, especially where it involves consultation in order to assess public opinion. For instance, in another environmental case, the court said, and in closing, that brings me back to the title of this letter, uh, that only, and I, I quote, only in the very plainest of cases 
can one say that the breach would have made no difference? There we are. I've taken you on a rather wandering and inconclusive journey through some highways and byways of causation. Thank you very much for your patience in accompanying me on the journey. Your Royal Highnesses, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, with the stimulating lecture delivered by the Right Honourable Lord Walker, we come to the successful conclusion of the 25th Sultan Aslan Shah Law Lecture. A big round of applause. Your Royal Highnesses, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Hampun Tuanku, before this evening's proceedings are brought to a close, it gives me great pleasure to announce a surprise part of the evening. Ladies and gentlemen, the Sultan Aslan Shah Law Lectures was conceived and initiated in 1986 to honor His Royal Highness Sultan Aslan Shah, specifically His Royal Highness' contribution to the development of Malaysian law. I quote, a most distinguished jurist, statesman and upholder of the rule of law. This is how the eminent former Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, Lord Wolfe, described His Royal Highness Sultan Aslan Shah. The highest regard and esteem in which His Royal Highness is held in the common law world can be seen from the accolades by the eminent speakers who have delivered the Sultan Aslan Shah Law Lecture. Justice Kennedy of the Supreme Court of the United States observed that the success of the Sultan Aslan Shah Law Lectures, to quote, is a tribute to His Royal Highness Sultan Aslan Shah's steadfast commitment to the rule of law. Lord Stain, another speaker, acknowledged, I quote, His Royal Highness is both a distinguished jurist and an eminent former judge whose valuable contribution to the law is widely known beyond the frontiers of this country. Likewise, Baroness Helena Kennedy recognized, to quote, His Royal Highness' reputation as a truly great lawyer, as a judge of great distinction, of immense wisdom and courage extends far beyond these shores. The unrivaled prestige of the Sultan Aslan Shah Law Lectures is evident from the list of distinguished speakers who have graced our shores to deliver the lecture which includes some of the most renowned and distinguished jurists, barristers and academics of our time. Indeed, the eminence and authority of the Sultan Aslan Shah Lectures transcends our shores and has received judicial recognition of the highest order. For example, the first Sultan Aslan Shah Law Lecture delivered by Professor W. R. Cornish in 1986 was referred by the House of Lords in the 1993 case of Woolwich and IRC. The 11th Sultan Aslan Shah Law Lecture delivered by Lord Stain in 1996 was referred to with approval by the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom as recently as last month in the case of Rainy Sky SA and Cookman Bank. Also, the 24th Sultan Aslan Shah Law Lecture delivered by Lord Roger last year has been referred to with approval by the Privy Council in the recent 2011 case of Belize Bank Limited and Attorney General of Belize. In recent years, the lectures have been delivered by speakers such as Associate Justice Anthony Kennedy, the first justice from the Supreme Court of the United States of America to deliver the lecture, Ms. Sherry Booth, the first woman to deliver a lecture in this series, Baroness Helena Kennedy, the ardent campaigner of human rights, Mr. Tony Blair, the former British Prime Minister whose first visit to Malaysia was to deliver this lecture, Lord Mark Seville, Lord Jonathan Mance and Lord Alan Roger of the House of Lords and the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen,
The Sultan Azla Shah Law Lecture Series is a testament to the tie that binds the Commonwealth, the common law tradition. As long as the common law continues to evolve, the Sultan Aslan Shah lectures will not only endure, but will remain a reference point for those interested in the vitality and development of the common law. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening, the common law will celebrate 25 years of the Sultan Aslan Shah Law Lecture. Your Royal Highnesses, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Pun Tuan Ku. In 2004, the first 17 lectures were published in the volume entitled The Sultan Aslan Shah Law Lectures, Judges on the Common Law. Now, to commemorate 25 years of this prestigious lecture series, a special publication entitled The Sultan Aslan Shah Law Lectures, Rule of Law, written constitutions and the common law tradition has been published for this milestone occasion. Ampun Tuan Ku. This special publication is lovingly dedicated to His Royal Highness Sultan Aslan Shah by his son, His Royal Highness Raja Nazrin Shah. Ampuntuanku, it now gives us enormous pleasure to invite His Royal Highness Raja Nasrin Shah to officially launch the book entitled The Sultan Aslan Shah Law Lectures, Rule of Law, Written Constitutions and the Common Law Traditions by presenting the first copy of the book to His Royal Highness Sultan Aslan Shah. From a filial son to a loving father. Thank you, Your Royal Highness. Ladies and gentlemen, before I bring this part of an evening to a close, permit me to take a short deviation from the script prepared. I have been asked to make a very short statement and announcement by His Royal Highness Raja Nasrin Shah, who has taken a keen and personal interest in this evening's event. This evening, 
just as we have celebrated 25 years of this lecture series and pay tribute to the person whose name these lectures bear, we also want to pause and acknowledge the contribution of one who has done so much to make these 25 lectures possible. Over the past 25 years, His Royal Highness Sultan Aslan Shah has been present at each and every one of these lectures. Together with His Royal Highness Twanku Sultan and His Royal Highness Raja Nazin Shah, we have had the privilege of enjoying 25 stimulating and thought-provoking lectures delivered by 25 distinguished speakers. A round of applause for that, ladies and gentlemen. One person apart from their Royal Highness has been largely responsible for making these lectures possible. Right from the very beginning, out of his passion and love of the law and justice, he undertook the responsibility each year of inviting the speakers and organizing these lectures, doing so with flair and consummate skill. Through the years, sacrificing time and energy, he has shouldered the responsibility with such great care and dedication that these lectures have become one of the most common law or one of the best in the common law world. He also edited two handsome volumes containing all these lectures, doing so with great thought and care as only a meticulous and learned editor can do. Together with his team, he has produced with mastery and skill what may be considered two pieces of art. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to invite you to join me in giving a big thunderous round of applause to our dear professor, as we call him, to thank this special person who has made the lectures over the past 25 years, not only possible, but successful, and for giving us these wonderful publications. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you're wondering who on earth I am talking about. Well, I will not put you in misery anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together. A big thunderous round of applause for Dr. Sri Visu Sinadurai. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Dato, please don't scold me after this function. The boss approved it, okay? <laughs> All jokes aside, ladies and gentlemen, Your Royal Highness, Sultan Aslan Shah, Your Royal Highness, Raja Nasrin Shah, Your Royal Highness, Twanku Zara Salim, Lord and Lady Walker, Your Highnesses, My Lords, Your Excellencies, may I humbly invite you to the reception.